negotiating the um, fluid boundaries between aesthetics and politics. Um, our first speaker um, is Iwan, um, Iwan Viono. Now, uh, I won't be um, reading the full biography because um, I hope that um, you, um, you have already um, familiarized yourself with the, um, with the full biography. Um, so Iwan um, is currently based in Yogyakarta. Uh, he's a performance artist and founder of Performance Performance Art Festival in Yogyakarta. Now, um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, Iwan has established um, Public Kitchen and Public Farm Yogyakarta for food sovereignty and sustainability. Uh, Iwan, the floor is yours for 10 minutes. Silakan. Thank you. Yeah. My text uh, as a title, Body Journey. I was a former student activist in the 90s when studying law at the campus of the Indonesian Islamic University to Jakarta. The student demonstrations emphasized the strength of the content of speech, banner, and poster as a complement. I live in Yogyakarta, which has a lot of art and cultural programs, various art media, very strategic for conveying political message. My intuition let me register as a fine art student in the Indonesian Art Institute, Yogyakarta. Finally, I studied at two different campuses. Use visual body action in public spaces or political demonstrations. I'll show you one video when I was a student. Video one. Video one. Video one. 31. Yeah, yeah, this is uh, one sample of uh, performance when I was students with uh, Tony, Teddy, with many pastor uh, activists. Uh, while the action uh, happened, uh, we making a banner. We want a good governance. And then after action in the yard of the campus, we brought the banner to the post office. Iwan, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but we can't see your video. Moment. <laughs> Number three, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you can see now. Already see. Now we still can't see your video. Now, yep, all good. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, this is in '97 in the Human Rights Day. You meet Teddy, Tony, and many uh, a street busker. And this action, we send the banner to government. We walk to the, the post office, uh, going to the street. And because so many human rights problems and the time, many kidnapping, many arrested activists, and we're doing this in the human rights day. And then when we walk back to campus, uh, the military truck waiting for us for integration. Uh, after some uh, discussion, finally they let us uh, no problem, no arrest. Okay, let's stop. Yeah, um, in the 90s, oh no, sorry. In the 90s, the public space uh, really under control by military government and the art program not allowed to bring any political issue. Uh, this is 
in 11 March 98 uh, the embryo of Taring Padi and Prong Club we work together uh, walking on the street with the convey of the the banner political one and then we FPG the president at the same time uh, he's uh, inaugurated in the parliament Yeah, this is the second photo, and then uh, the the demonstrations getting bigger and bigger until March. The president resigns, uh, followed by a big riot in many cities. Toward the fall of Suharto power, political demonstration with body actions became popular. Recent decade, there have been many demonstrations by student worker and even uh, mothers, women protesting against the increase of the basic food stuff, convoyed by means of body action. Journalists wrote it is as a theatrical action. Some wrote it is happening art. Photo three and. Oh. Yeah, this is the the female farmer uh, protesting the government uh, doing construction for the cement factory in the in their uh, farming area, and one of the farmer uh, had to go to the office of government with the with the feet in in cement, so couldn't couldn't walk. And after uh, protesting this, uh, she passed away because uh, too long uh, the 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 leg the feet in the in this cement. And this is my own performance in ninety six, uh, protesting about the cutting forest and protesting the people put the. Trash and on the river, also burning everywhere. This is walking, going to the radio radio station. Want to talk about this in the radio, but before it entered the radio station, the police with the a completed uh, weapon arrested me for half day. Yeah, uh, the body action media for political education already belong to the people, even though they are not artists. This is the the body bur body burning suicide by by students, and even not much uh, changing. But the people already used their own way to to do the protest. The transition from the traditional culture to modern, even to contemporary, is never ending. Never ending body transitions inside the political context is so much chaotic, mix up everything in political constellations. The daily government governance system is not really modern one. In the contemporary art context, how the traditional body practice modern and the contemporary one. In the other side. Traditional route developed became tourism up, and the late contemporary art progress mostly a pop trendy and global one. The Indonesian native people have strong root of body action, from their ritual of the baby birth, the wedding, the funeral, even the protest itself have such some ways to express performatively by bodies. Every time they had baby birth, they cut the placenta. To bury it in front of the house and put a light. The wedding, they have to follow the stepping on the, the egg ritual. An ancient burial ritual in Tanah Toraja, the body of the dead person walking alone to the cemetery, followed by the ceremony participant.
uh, but uh, lately this ritual not exist but every year they change the cloth of the dead body uh, open up the the grave in the kingdom era uh, people could protest with top of pepe or meditate under the sun or like sun bathing in the middle of the palace court even just happens recently so this very very a uh, classic uh, protest uh, doing a uh, sun bathing meditation in front of the kingdom the palace in the struggle era for the independence of indonesia many graffiti supported the spirit of the people revolutions against the colony colonialism as well as many revolutionary songs painting sculpture poem writing cartoon it is as the early independent country were many at base the social issues from 1945 to 1965 even though divided into two big groups as socialist and liberal as a group of lekra and a group of manikebu since 65 uh, political incidents no mass political art anymore because the government prohibit and ban art works and political art programs the new order of government close with the liberal countries group for the foreign investments in indonesia in my 90s generation so many missing people artists activists currently art had developed more to do with the global market and much controlled by moral and religions their sonship it doesn't mean the religion is good or bad but the human right democracy racism religions and are being political tools to prolong the power and control the people in fact the spirit of colonization and the mental slavery still around this is the poster of pluralism by taring padi also my group and we put on the street poster everywhere in the election day uh, seasons because every election day the political group using those uh, hoax uh, issue about religion uh, communism uh, ask people to fight each other uh, uh, to control and then have have to move their voice to their own political uh, group for uh, to vote how to discourse the a to day as part of the society development while the environment is increasingly damaged and how the global political constellation to work together to build the planet harmoniously art is growing but tends to be more difficult for the wider republic to understand politicians are mostly focused on their own career after about 20 uh, 25 years as a practice activism art i conclude that the artist is the medium the artist life is a space to perform and exhibit and the beauty of the art in the living context is not in the physical or tangible medium video and can play yeah <laughs> This is my performance in the red light district about uh, condom democracy. The people to ask a uh, male to use condom in the prostitution area. So I wear like a sex worker, and then uh, three men wear a three mask. You must write democracy and capital and writing me, and hand, I hand out, hand out uh, paper. A stick a condom and text when you want with me use condom in the name of human rights democracy and capital agriculture institute yeah. you want sorry to interrupt you have um uh, one more minute yeah how yeah uh, satu minute lagi ya 
Oke, okay, Pak. Satu menit lagi, Iwan. Oke, okay, oke. Okay. Satu menit lagi, jadi langsung ke sana. Atau yang terakhir aja, Pak. Ada apa aja, Pak? Oke. Oke, Pak. Oke, Pak. Oke, Pak. Oke, Pak. Oke, My last uh, photo for the forum. Uh, how to use the body in the in the festival? I do the body auction. The public can auction the body for one night. Uh, I criticize the commercial system in the society. I think my thoughts enough. Thank you very much for everybody. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Iwan. Um, uh, I'm sure um, we will have uh, a lot more discussion. And thank you for that um, strong opening message. Um, you know, it's very, um, it's very. Uh, we can see the strong connection um, in your practice. Um, um, as you know, the artist body, the participation of the audience is important, but. We can also see how, you know, your practice kind of bringing um, messages of politics, um, human rights issue to the street and um, kind of confronting the public with that as well. Perhaps opening up in an era where, where previously such issues can never be discussed. Um, so um, then from Indonesia, we're moving to Hong Kong um, to we have Clara um, Chum, um, our presenter. Um, she's an artist and um, recently elected um, district councillor um, based in Hong Kong. Congratulations, Clara. Um, mm, thank you. Uh, a belated Hello. congratulation. Um, and as one of the founding members of CNG Art Department in 2007, um, Clara, um, as um, co-founder of the um, collective, have always used their art to respond to social and political issues. Uh, over to you, Clara. Thank you. Let me um, share screen. Thanks for inviting and thanks for everyone joining this uh, uh, forum. And look forward to um, more discussion later on. Um, so yes, for who, uh, for all of you who may not know me already, then this is actually our space, um, CNG apartment in, uh, in an old building without elevator in Hong Kong. Uh, yeah, you can see the Chinese characters hold tight uh, upon freedom, even in the storm. Yeah, so this is, it was a slogan, very uh, common, popular use, popularly used in 2014 during the umbrella movement. And we painted it there. Uh, since then, it's still up there now in 2020. And so we, we I think, yeah, all, a lot of you know and may, so, uh, watched uh, news about the 2019's uh, protest in Hong Kong, um, which actually I would say is a sort of a continuation of the, our resistance to that, um, yeah, more and more suppression uh, upon Hong Kong's demo, uh, the democracy and society in the past few years. Um, so this is how we looked once upon a time in 2007. And in, in the past, actually our space had uh, host a lot of different exhibitions in, in, indoor in the space to, uh, which can be a group show, solo exhibitions later on as well in response to social cultural issues. Literally with the exhibition, we talk about the, the, the current situation in Hong Kong. And the, at the very beginning, when we, when we started that in 2007, the idea was that um, we, we saw that there was a lack of such a platform uh, for the visual artists, for the artists to, to respond to society. However, we actually saw a lot of such um, uh, artworks and exhibitions before 1997, before the handover uh, of Hong Kong from uh, British to the mainland. Um, so we were wondering why, what happened? Like how come 10 years after the handover, we suddenly became like more quiet? Uh, we, we had a lot of, we thought of a lot of different reasons. Perhaps uh, later on after 1997, after the handover, uh, the, the, uh, all, the, all the media around the world were no longer, you know, that much interest, interested 
in the art scene in Hong Kong. But before then, before the handover, it was a big issue. And then everyone tried to look into how artists respond to this issue about cultural identity, about the, the local identity. Um, but however, we, we don't think that um, artists necessarily made less artwork in response to the same topic after 1997. So uh, when we had a chance to open up a, a space, uh, another platform, we tried to see if we can also make use of this platform to encourage more um, but basically dialogue conversation with their art language uh, yeah to address um, current issues in town yeah um, but I, today I, I only will show a few uh, examples um, and here is one um, project that I, I like a lot it began with a very very small idea very very small scale kind of action but it actually uh, throughout the whole time uh, I think it, it gathered more energy than we thought uh, at the beginning that it could. Um, the, at the very beginning, it was called an, a sick leave art, as, uh, art exhibition. Um, it was an exhibition held within the uh, art space, the NG apartment, addressing the working conditions for the Hong Kong people. Long working hours, everyone is afraid to take the leave. So we have a Cantonese saying, uh, bang. you have the time to die, but no time to get sick. It's very, um, very, very sad, actually very sad. But um, it, it, it also can show you how the Hong Kong society is like. Um, the, the, the perfect capitalist system is really, really um, uh, uh, captivating everyone's energy in their job, in their work. So until now, even after the whole 2019's uh, anti-extradition bills uh, movement, we still do. We still have not got a uh, one successful day of complete uh, strike. We could not make it happen. <laughs> you can see how job is important. How everyone is, you know, uh, paying mortgage and you know already chained up in this uh, well planned capitalist system. So um, yeah, uh, the working condition definitely for the laborers would be one big concern for, for the cultural workers here. So it was a, an exhibition, a very small exhibition at the beginning. Um, one of the pieces within was uh, by an artist, uh, Doris Wong, uh, uh, inviting Chinese doctor to help the art workers or the audience to, to check up their body uh, because uh, the people in the art industry usually drink too much, maybe sleep too late, not healthy enough, not uh, uh, having enough money to, to, to have body check uh, very often. So yeah and just uh, some other pieces in, in the show. And these, during the show, we also initiate a day. So hereby, we also invite all of you to join next year. In, on May 13, you can join the International, International Sick Leave Day, take a leave from work, do art, because art is healing. Um, so we started it. Then, but then you can imagine, in, on a Wednesday afternoon, we, we call for the people to go out to, for outdoor painting, don't work. Uh, of course, only a few people will show up physically, but um, we slowly we, we see that more people uh, got the idea online. We, we kept doing it every year. We kept doing it with just a small number of people on a weekday afternoon. We go out for do, doing some simple kind of art activity. And then, um, but slowly, slowly, we see that over internet, more people pay attention to this idea. And in 2013, something really, something really interesting happened. Um, someone online uh, who I do not know at all actually reappropriate this day, uh, calling it uh, the, the International Shooting Day because in Cantonese, shooting also means to um, relieve your release your uh, responsibility from your shoulder, like say, ball, like yeah, get rid of the responsibility. Don't work. Just go to have a break. Okay, so so we, we found it very very interesting. Some someone we reach out to some people uh, not in our own circle, and then they already play with this idea already. And and I wondered why what happened? Like it has always been a small scale activity. What happened? Um, yeah, it's also the newspaper reported it, and then uh, on the radio one one year we 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 heard the DJ. Um, saying today is International Sick Leave Day. But, but then probably the, uh, the DJ didn't know who uh, initiated at the very beginning. Um, but then later on, when we uh, think about it like really seriously, we, we thought that this is also, you know, a small idea actually grew as the city also has more people concerned about the same issue. Uh, in 2013, actually, there was a really massive dog worker strike in, uh, to, uh, to play that 
yeah, took place in Hong Kong. And we, we think this organic development of one small idea actually grew along with all, all the, of the different seedlings in the town. And that's why in yeah, 2013, since then, more people uh, would be more aware of the working condition of the laborers in Hong Kong. And also um, for, the, for those who tried to reappropriate International Sick Leave Day, probably are those who also seek for alternative kind of um, expression about this whole, uh, whole situation. Yeah, you can go, go on uh, to protest and join this drive. I, I believe a lot of artists and cultural workers did, as, uh, did that as well. But at the same time, we also, want, we also actually need some other kind of expression to, to release our, our, our stress during the, the, the whole um, protest. And then uh, maybe many of you still remember 2013, actually it was the umbrella movement, uh, a really big scale occupied movement in, in Hong Kong uh, happened a year after that uh, strike I mentioned a while ago. So you can see how, how everything is chained and connected and then developed, you know, a sort of, you can say organically, but also with a lot of the input by, by the uh, civic society altogether. And I particularly like some of the scenes during the umbrella movement, where um, on the right hand side, you can see a uh, uh, Taoism's uh, sort of uh, small temple over there. There was also a chapel for, for, for the Catholic as well. Um, so uh, different kinds of rituals uh, re relig uh, related to the traditional religion or uh, just, uh, you know, sort of different kinds of ritual that we will see in, in the normal kind of protest of the civil, uh, civic uh, society also, you know, happened there. Um, I, and then um, we also still uh, had different exhibitions within the CNG apartment. I, I'll just take, talk about two shows. Um, it was um, last year in 2019, uh, a young artist actually did a series of um, stop motion animation, recapturing all the really suppressive um, emotion and stories happened between 2014 after the umbrella movement until 2019, which was last year's big protest. Um, actually, I, I will want to tell you all in the past five years, um, uh, a lot of censorship issues, uh, incidents actually happened in Hong Kong. So that the government after the umbrella movement never stopped uh, suppressing the, the democratic uh, society. But then, um, but then, um, yeah, but there, there was not enough um, room for, for the other people to, to express. So this artist, through her stop motion animation, actually talk about all the dark um, side of the society being suppressed. And then this year, uh, in 2020, um, uh, June, on June 12th, another young artist actually made an exhibition in, within our space. And, Actually, in the past year, in 2019, we did not have a lot of exhibitions because everyone was busy going out <laughs> fighting. But then this year, because of the corona, coronavirus, um, we had to sort of slow down a bit more. And because of the crowd control policy, which also has become the excuse of the government to control the protests coming out, of course. Um, mm -hmm. so, so sometimes uh, we you make use of the in, internal indoor space again nowadays. Um, this exhibition seems to be very poetic with a lot of photos uh, of the cloud, of the sky. But actually, these are all the, um, the tear gas bombs shoot into the sky, witnessed by, the, by this artist in the, yeah, in last year. So in the photos she, um, she captured from the new screen, she erased all the um, surroundings, but just leave the white, white tear gas image. For, for the document as a sort of a documentation, but also a remind, reminder of us how easy, you know, you can romanticize um, the, some, some uh, the, the protests or, or take the, another extreme interpretation of the situation. But um, the numbers are, are real, how many tear gas we, we had, you know, in, in Hong Kong in 2019. And she also made um, a piece in, yeah, in, in response, uh, situated in, in the gallery. So, um, yeah, I think I, I, it's my time is thank you. up. So I will yes, stop thank here you, for now first. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, um, Clara, um, for a um, really interesting talk. And also, um, thank you for sharing and updating us about um, the current situation in Hong Kong. 
but where we see typically you know artists kind of now um i think working in more synergies yeah with, with um you know kind of street activism um that is uh, that is kind of generated by the political situation in hong kong um so uh for our third and final speakers um we have um jennifer are you there jennifer Terrell and Tian Wei Won from post museum in singapore um now post museum um is an independent cultural and social space in singapore um it is an open platform for um, examining contemporary life uh, promoting the arts and connecting people um so over to you jennifer and Tian. hi okay, uh, let, let me just share screen um okay hi uh morning you all can hear me right i guess yeah yeah so basically um i think uh for us, um, we've, we've been actually really, really um, interested to think about, you know, what, what is, has the field of art could play in a world that is increasingly um, unjust and unfree. So I think one of the basic things that we are really interested to think about is that we believe that art can change the world uh, and can participate in shaping a better world. So Post Museum kind of emerged from that impulse in wanting art to play a more proactive platform. Oh. Is it working? Uh, yeah, so, um, and I think one of the things that we are really quite interested in is that, you know, uh, how can we practice the city in a more meaningful way? Um, and to practice the city for us kind of uh, meant asserting and claiming the right to the city. So we'll just share a few projects and, and sort of think about how that kind of uh, expands out from there. So, uh, Jen, do you want to? Okay, so uh, so Post Museum actually started by having a space in Little India for four years. But after we moved out of the space, uh, actually towards the end of the space uh, in 2011, this case of Bukit Brown came up. Um, the government announced that they are going to build a highway through this very big Chinese cemetery uh, that is uh, quite historical and uh, has a lot. Uh, important people buried there. There's, there's a lot of history and nature um, in this place. So we actually at that point we didn't we have not been to the cemetery, and uh, for a lot of Singaporeans we don't even know that this place exists because you know cemeteries uh, traditionally is only for you know relatives or for people to visit when it's important days. So we don't really use it as a park, and so. Um, for us who have no ancestors buried there, we actually don't know about this place and we've never been. So, um, but when this case came up in the middle um, of 2011, we were kind of surprised why there's a lot of noise about it. So we actually went to have a look and then we, we began um, trying to help to save the place. So it, it kind of started as an activist uh, with an activistic motif, uh, and not, it wasn't really an art thing yet for us. So, but what we tried to do was we we really tried to um, get more people in to see the place. We had uh, regular tours, um, and then we also did things like too fast. We also did things like um, get get people to you know like write down their thoughts and uh, make posters. Um, so here are some photos, uh, and um, only in uh, 2014, after we failed to stop the highway, um, we were invited to do this exhibition as part of a, a group exhibition in the Singapore Art Museum. So by 2014, actually, um, most of the activist activities that's um, that was done by a whole group of people, uh, you know, including us, of course, but a lot of people who are not tra not career activists. So that's like normal people, um, housewives, doc uh, students, you know, all kinds of people. Um, we tried to stop, stop the highway, but it didn't happen. And then during that time, it was very contentious, but by 2014, the whole case was kind of settled because we, we failed, right? Um, but um, 
yeah, so that that was the time when we actually started working on this project, kind of this project called Bukit Brown Index. Yeah, you mm. yeah. so um, I guess the index sort of um, sort of uh, document the case of Bukit Brown. So uh, as you can see, so the index will actually collect all materials about the contestation case. So maybe in a way, what we're interested to think about is that this is a case of sort of uh, reflect the larger perspective of the grammar of the city. It will also, of course, reflect the struggle over the soul of the city, the soul of Singapore. And um, for example, what uh, one of the things that was part of the index was this uh, original document um, that was first released to the public. Uh, as you can see, new dual four lane road to release the congestion of uh, this road. That, uh, so and that's the reason why the cemetery needs to be developed. So if you can see in the language as well, the new dual four lane really means eight lane. And what you can see is actually this is the road of the contention of why the cemetery needs to be redeveloped. As you can see, it's actually hardly congested. It's only congested during the times of congestion. But what's really interesting is that in this image, you can see seven lanes. Um, and what's really interesting also, uh, I thought that the reading for us was that if we needed eight lanes, um, why wasn't the urban redevelopment, the imagination of that, not able to find space on the left and the right of the road to make that one more lane in order to stop a disruption of a, a heritage site? So that was one of the main questions that we were interested to think about as a case. Um, so uh, things sort of like became artworks from um, uh, through the indexing of things, so this this is a list of names that of uh, of the deceased. Yeah, you can see that uh, names of the deceased that will be exhumed, but they they would have no uh, place uh, because actually most of the remains of these uh, names here, uh, most of the people here do not have um, descendants that will claim them after. Uh, so uh, this is just a list of names, and uh, this is another piece from the index which is called the Bukit Brownies. So basically, as Jen was saying, that a lot of the people that came up to want to save the space were actually uh, people that we, um, that came from all sorts of backgrounds. So this is, for, so uh, in this part of the work, we actually uh, asked the, okay, so they called themselves the Bukit Brownies. They will be helping and, and, and do stuff in the site. So uh, this is Kwok Ping from the Nature Society and he chose uh, a site uh, of his favorite spot, which is in front of the giant Mahang tree. Um, this is Ailun, who is a translator for Chinese English. Uh, she chose a spot of uh, a pet that was illegally buried in the site of the cemetery. And then uh, this is Raymond Go, who is um, one of the co-founders of the Asian Paranormal Investigators. So he chose his favorite spot was actually in front of the um, uh, a cluster of Qing Dynasty tombs. I think you need to move. So we did various things like collect stories from people as well, uh, from uh, first-hand and second-hand sources. Um, and then uh, we also index uh, videos where people go on you know, to look for ghosts. A uh, story of the Hantugala, which is a, a forest spirit. Um, yeah, so then, um, so for Bukit Brown, actually, we really tried to include, uh, we tried to open up the, the the space for people to participate and to really have a say in what's going on to this thing that is usually just decided by the government. Um, then we were also interested in these uh, traditional outdoor stages, and that that led to um, a work that we did, uh, the biggest Bukit Brown index piece actually. Uh, which has all these chairs and then the stage. Um, and then we have a virtual reality performance and, and these three people actually, they have like these goggles where they put on and then they can watch the performance that goes on all the time. Mm. So, yeah, I think that they will see this, um, once they put on the goggle, they will see actually a performance and it's called Triptych of the Unseen. And basically it's actually a, a play a performance on repeat uh, by three characters in the story of development in Bukit Brown. One is the ghost, and one is the bureaucrat, and one is the activist. Okay. Um, yeah. And then when people walk to behind the stage, you'll actually see a kind of diorama. The idea was to see a diorama of a stage. And this was actually built from 
the paper offerings that we burn during Hungry Ghost Festival. But maybe just a bit of context that actually what you see on the stage, usually if you see this in the outdoor stage and it's, the, it's for God's um, these performances, the first two rows are usually left empty because they're meant for ghosts to sit. So what we're really interested in this spectrumness of the, that space is that what kind of doesn't get spoken and what kind of doesn't get uh, forgotten is, is what is on repeat. And I think what we were really interested in was how then do this how then does this story actually talk a lot about the grammar of the city, right? Because the, the whole idea is that the development in Singapore, what we're privileging is the value of the land, which then is then attached to a lot of other things, which uh, the people, even ourselves, right, constantly have to renegotiate. Why is something, why is the land that's so expensive cannot be something else that is for the people? Um, yeah, so maybe we just want to finish this school. No, it's okay. Yeah, we have a few minutes. Yeah, so then um so then we come to this other project which we collaborated with the uh, ceramic artist Michelle Lim on. Uh this project is called Awaken the Dragon. We have two dragon kilns that's left uh in Singapore and basically uh we every most of the land in Singapore is owned by the government and then uh the, so these two dragon kilns actually sit on land who, who's which has a uh, lease that's going to end soon. So to preempt um, government's plans, actually we tried to do this project where we we brought a lot of people to this uh, this locations so that there is kind of demand for it. Um, and what we did was actually we created our workshops and then we uh, we tried to get each person to to um, make one work so that in the end we have three thousand works. That we can but uh that we can fire together in the dragon kiln and so uh so we have you know students old people um officers all kinds of people making work and we also have students to come and you know sort out the wood which we will use for burning and then uh we had a conference we had the firing festival we have workshops music um food of course um, and then it, at the end, after the firing, we also had this big exhibition where people could come and see all the works and then they could claim, claim their works home as well. Um, and then, right, you want to add anything for that? No. Okay, so that, that in the end, um, we managed to save the kilns for nine years. But, so this was in 2013 and then actually the nine years is coming up soon. So we might have to do one more festival. Uh, but now with the COVID situation, we're not sure if we can. So, um, okay, so now uh, this is the latest project that we're working on. It's basically um, talking about the issue of waste as well as labor issues. Um, and uh, Less Unwaste is the, the name, but actually right now we have planned three different parts. And the first part is, um, is on clothes. So, uh, as you may or may not know, actually we cannot recycle clothes, and and because of fast fashion, there is a lot of waste, um, wasted clothes, and uh, basically they're just sitting somewhere or in the landfill or in Singapore we just incinerate them, uh, and then so what we did, what we are doing is we are actually holding workshops where we teach people how to upcycle things, uh, upcycle clothes into things that they can use. So it could be a bag, it could be new clothes, it could be you know, any uh, decoration, anything. Um, and um, this first part is called the sweatshop. And actually, we are also referring to to all the labor that goes into making clothes that, is, that are now very cheap and, and we don't actually see it. So we just wear it maybe one, two times and then we throw it away. Uh, and then so this is a way for us to also kind of talk, uh, think about and open up this issue about you know, consumerism and capitalism and all these bigger issues. Um, ten, one yeah. more minute, Ken. Yeah, but I, I think that maybe it's also, I think it's slightly different, but also in this way that, I think one of the, the main question we have about um, problems of the earth is that, um, is that we cannot see it for what it is. It's very, very embedded within a circular kind of uh, relationship um, that is pretty global. And I think that one of the, the questions we have for, for less un, un waste was that, that how do we kind of make a global problem visible to the people that are completely seem and appear to be divorced from those processes? So 
I'm mean, just maybe, you know, one of the really interesting work that I came across was Caroline Knowles in his, her story of the flip-flops, which is quite interesting because in her ethnographic work, she actually followed the journey of the, the very cheapest shoe where they would have. But one of the really interesting things that I, I thought I took away from that was that there was no relation in each process, right? From, from the moment that it came from an oil field in Kuwait to the moment that it ends up in a landfill in Philippines, none of these people actually have a relationship with each other. And I think that that's one of the things that we are really thinking, like how do, how, do, how do you as an individual, as a person living here at a place, uh, react to something that's so global and so big? And how do you change that perspective on, on, on that matter? Lah? So I think on that note, I think we're done. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> you're done, but you're not quite done. I can feel that there will be lots of questions coming in. Uh, in fact, uh, we yep. invite um, our audience to um, start um, submitting their questions. Um, but thank you for that um, really um, important ending, um, or if you like, um, you know, uh, kind of triggering um, our next discussion, a following discussion on the role of um, artists and um, visuality, if you like, to bring something visible that when we feel we are disconnected to um, um, particularly, um, you know, the environment. Um, but I suppose while we're waiting uh, for uh, questions from the audience, um, I'm just curious, um, this is for everyone, a question that I pose to everyone. Um, with the recent, uh, recent um, you know, uh, pandemic, how has this um, affected your practice and your plan? And um, have you kind of shifted your focus on activism um, uh, responding to this pandemic? How, how are you doing this? Um, Maybe I, I can, yeah, yeah, because yeah. I already talked about it a little bit a while ago. Yeah. Um, actually, we in the past month, we see more Hong Kong artists started to put, on, put up exhibitions. I think we are ready to, to express even more. But then um, I think within galleries and exhibition space, we still feel a bit safer a bit more safe actually um to yeah than expressing a lot of such on the streets because now the, yeah the pen, the, because of the pandemic the, the police really is uh charging you like uh yeah the fine once you you have more than at this moment four people on the streets all together they, they would just make use of this uh excuse so it's really e easy for them to um yeah to to just get rid of any kind of uh uh, protest movement on, on the street right now but yeah but then uh, yeah on the other hand I think uh, a lot of artists and cultural workers really actually suffer at this moment because uh, we don't get to have so many freelance jobs like the past uh, the exhibition industry is shut <laughs> and so uh, a lot of us are also trying to see how to yeah how to make it more as an op opportunity to, to move to move on to maybe some other kind of art form. I think maybe it's the same everywhere for the mm. other artists as well. Yeah. Mm. Um, thank you. Um, we have a first um, question here, um, which is, I think this is directed to everyone. Um, is there a difference between art activism and other forms of activism? And in, is there a need to distinguish them from each other? Um, so the question is, is there a difference between art activism and other forms of activism? And is there a need to distinguish one from the other? Iwan? Yeah, hello. Yeah, hello. Yeah, um, uh, we, we are based in the traditional uh, society. Actually, art is part of daily life, and then how we are uh, moved to be modern in contemporary one. Art should be at the crossroad of all discipline. Art in the crossroad of uh, social politics, economy, culture, environment, and spirituality. But lately, the art uh, growing by it itself, and even sometimes. Uh, are difficult to understand uh, with the wider public. So my my vision, my missions, 
at uh, filter when the society or politician make a dirt and at uh, deliver those uh, positive thoughts from from all discipline to be a collective uh, movement something like that that should uh, make a uh, everybody connected so to be contextual living context in the social uh, space something like that yeah mm -hmm. um uh clara would you like to respond to that question sure um well for me i think it may not be necessary to distinguish because then for example at this moment in hong kong i think most well, most, I, I would not say everyone, but most Hong Kong people would, would like to um, keep on this energy to, to look for, so, you know, the, the, better, the better democratic system for, for the city, for the town. And, and it doesn't matter where, which field you are from. So if you already make use of the art language, you know, which is the most comfortable language that you've been using, then, then why not? And then in, I think in the in last year, we, a lot of the, the um, Hong Kong protester, protesters also recognized how important it is to make use of the visual language to connect with people around the world. Like, it doesn't need to be like art, art, like installation, fine arts, but definitely a lot of the poster, really good posters, e-banners that, that really uh, uh, communicate a very simple idea about what's going on in Hong Kong has been very, it is, has been very important in, in the movement in Hong Kong in the past year, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Jennifer and Tian? Well, I think it's interesting your selection of the three artists because we are actually, I think our practice is quite different. Uh, and, and also in some ways we, are, we have different starting points. Uh, and actually for us, we, we look at our practice less as art activism and more as a social practice. So we are really interested more in how we can get people together, how we can open up space for, for dialogue and for people to find their own emancipation. Uh, so in many ways, we just facilitate things instead of like lead, um, lead some, kind of, some kind of activist activity. That's how we see ourselves. So that's, I think that's the difference between what we do and like real hard activism. Because for me, I think activism is very goal-oriented and they really want to achieve, you know, like uh, no death penalty or, you know, something really quite direct. But for us, we are interested to talk about the issues that surrounding um, uh, maybe heritage or something and and then we we are interested to see how people can react and how people can come in and they can they can become themselves or who they want to be so it, it's kind of a, a different uh different way of looking at you know this uh social action yeah mm. um yeah but because because i think it's also about as much as um you know um, achieving a goal but also achieving with uh you know together with so it's i mean um i think the diversity of um you know your practice and speakers today actually kind of reflect perhaps the openness of the field but when we talk about um you know that intersection between um aesthetics and politics that came from different localized contexts perhaps um but um so we have another question um oh there's so many questions coming popping up now <laughs> Um, okay, um, I guess um, one of the question is that how to balance um, between your personal expression and some kind of publicly oriented actions. So from your um, kind of, um, you know, um, um, as an artist and then other, other as a publicly kind of, you know, um, direction of where your work is doing when you're engaging with the community. Uh, can I speak first? I, I think of course. We, we, don't, yeah. we don't need to balance. It's because we are so angry. I'm, I'm really angry. That's why I still keep working. But then, um, mm -hmm. I, I, as the, you also uh, at the introduction uh, tell everyone that I, you know, I, uh, I ran into, I ran the election 
and became a district council. It, it was also because of my anger, <laughs> I'm too angry. And then also because, of course, uh, if I, I don't try to make more changes, I, I, can, I may lose the, the, the soil for, for art making, which is you know, the, the thing I, I love the most. So I think maybe it's the emotion, definitely, that also helps us with the actions. Yeah. How about the others? Mm. How about the others? <laughs> Uh, yeah, and, uh, the artists have to connect with the, the new context in the time and space and the social thought on the area. And then something happens. So the artists uh, no need to keep any medium or technique where they go around the world. They have to create a new context there. We have to, to, to connect with the space time and social thought there and then something happens and the art is, is exists so this is uh, what is uh, activism or not uh, no matter but the art have a uh, uh, something uh, alive at that moment also mm. sometimes I, I i saw the the contemporary gallery why are they always making program indoor everything indoor uh, the the medium the same conventional mediums forever, but they, they thought this is contemporary art. Contemporary art not based any space, time, or medium, technique, can be anywhere. And suddenly we have a war or crisis, and then everything is closed, and everybody jobless, no art, no artist, no studio. So the contemporary art is something living like that. So mm. art is always constant, something like that. Thank you. Uh, Jen, and Jen. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe I think that individually there's a lot of, um, I guess, negotiations within ourselves or, or but maybe also, I mean, maybe this idea that um, we are becoming uh, um, within the city, right? And, and I think that, um, I don't know if uh, it is true for everyone, but sometimes there's a switch that you just get switched on uh, from an experience in, 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 in your encounters in the city, right? Or in, in your lived environment. And sometimes it's one of the most, it could be the most banal thing, right? I mean, like suddenly realizing that, oh, right, well, maybe a, 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 I'm, I'm just taking like stories from how, because I think one of the things that um, we're interested in, maybe at least in the topic of uh, activism and art, is the participation in the right to the city. How, how come some of us are willing to, to, to not do anything or as opposed to do something? Um, which is, I guess, one of the interesting part. Lah. So I felt that maybe yeah, there's no right answer and right wrong answer, but there's also this process, which I think maybe could be the largest failure in how art writes its own history, right? That we, we tend to sort of either fall into uh, trappings of uh, modernity, where we kind of um, modern with, uh, I mean, with the idea of looking at objects uh, mm. without looking at relationships. I thought that's something to think about. Lah. Mm. Mm, I think that's also raised by um, an issue that's raised by some of the questions here, that tension between, um, you know, presenting your um, kind of, you know, social political work within the gallery space and, and that tension presenting in, in, in the public space. Um, so um, we have one last question, um, unfortunately. So um, kind of to um, wrap it up, um, uh, let me just kind of read that question. Uh, but yeah, um, so um, a question here about this potential detachment um, from social polit political context that the white cube might bring. Um, so I wonder if you can say more about that when you present your work within, uh, have you, uh, or when you present your work inside um, white cube gallery, for example, are you kind of noticing that detachment? Um, I think that's what um, the audience is asking. Maybe I, I begin first, uh, because yeah. I actually in the end talk about two uh, solo exhibitions in the indoor space of CNG apartment. Um, well, I, as I mentioned, actually, uh, we, I think nowadays uh, uh, more Hong Kong people recognize that it is important to keep multiple kind of channels in yeah, in this whole movement. So it's not about which one is better, but it 
it is about how many more channels we can we can get we can have and then yeah so at this moment um at a, at a particular moment for example now uh when pro outdoor protest is not so uh uh possible we we move on to other channels like indoor space but at the same time the i think the white cube space also give us a, a, some room to yeah as you mentioned to deal with the, the trauma some of you mentioned deal with the trauma and also that a lot of the yeah, overload the emotion when, when we go on to, to the streets. So some sometimes I think nowadays we kind of recognize this is also important to to have the, the indoor exhibition as well. Yeah. Mm, very interesting. Um Iwan? Yeah, uh I mentioned in my text before, uh as a artist, uh as a media, artist life as as a art space as a exhibition space or performance space and uh, the beauty not in the medium and the technique but the beauty in the living uh, contact or in the happening uh, at the moment something like that so not based in indoor outdoor uh, no, ma no matter mm. where, where we are doing something that have to be something happens Mm -hmm. So again, artist is the medium. Artist life is uh, art space will be indoor or not everywhere, and the medium technique only the artistic language, not the the destination of the artistic, only to distribute the message, but the beauty in the happening. Thank you. Ken and Ken. Yeah. Yeah. I I think I I agree with Clara. Actually, the white cube space is useful as an additional space and the fact that it's separate from i mean it's kind of separate but never totally separate as well from the context right so i think it's it's uh, useful as a space for contemplation as a space to really uh if you want to um, it really depends on the audience right if you're going to take like a minute to walk through the room there's no point but if you really want to look at something properly or you want to think about some issue uh, seriously, I think a white cube space is is important because it is it offers that kind of uh, quietness in a way for for that to happen, and mm -hmm. and and also you know for for people who have not actually been in in that outdoor or, or activity space, having being able to see something after that would also might also, you know, emancipate you in some way. It might also, you know, like you learn something also. It's, it really depends on the viewer, I think. So it's important um, that there is an additional avenue, an additional space for, for mm. something else mm. to happen. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah, because I, I think that the idea is that, because um, the idea is maybe one of the things I, I felt that is also a limit when we are organizing or curating uh, exhibitions and stuff like that, that we always always think that the audience acts in a certain way. So I think one of the things that I, I've always been interested in is uh, uh, being naughty or being this, uh, you know, being disobedient, especially for, you know, I think Singapore is quite famous for being like very, very like, oh, yeah, you cannot chew, chew chewing gum and all these things, right? So I think what was really interesting is that people never listen. I, I find that people don't um, do things that they're always told. Uh, and and sometimes that's interesting, right? Because even when we set rules in the galleries, we always imagine that you know a certain relationship that is made with an artwork with an exhibition is in, in such a defined way. Um, but actually, sometimes we know that there are so many ways of experiencing something. And whether like what Jen said that oh, even what, one minute is that even enough to suddenly change your perspective in life? Sometimes there could be seconds. I don't know, like <laughs> life and death moments that seconds that you think you will die and then but that that experience changed your life so i'm i'm interested in in that that, that whole idea la, that maybe that's where this mm -hmm. is right that something is going to happen we have some idea of how it will happen but actually i'm, I'm pretty happy to imagine that anything can happen yeah. and and mm -hmm. frankly i think that's where we are like out of ideas that is the world is like yeah sorry yeah. any all i have to say no, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, but unfortunately, um, that is all the time that we have today to speak about um, 
um, you know, this very important topic. Um, so um, I suppose if I don't want to, wrap, you know, kind of end the dialogue, I think it's, you know, we can continue talking um, and hopefully we can continue to have this conversation about, you know, this um, intersection of um, between art and activism. Um, because I think uh, from what I gather uh, from the conversation today, that art um, in its all forms and spaces does amplify um, activism and um, in fact um, facilitate key messages um, and information which may compensate for um, lack or manipulation um, of official narratives. Um, I think also where civic spaces have shrunk, um, art can also provide alternative um, venue um, what two gallery space, for example, uh, for activists to broaden their movements and support um, their work um, despite curtailed democratic spaces. So I think the synergies between activism and art has become more important than ever. Um, again, referring to what you say at the end about how do we practice in a world that seems to be more becoming more unjust. Um, so we are also a little bit disobedient with our time here. We're way over time. <laughs> But um, so thank you, everyone. Thank you for the presenters. Thank you for members, um, audience that's um, joining us today. Um, again, um, thank you to the Asian Art Dialogue crew for organizing the event. Um, and please watch this space because there'll be more events by the group. Um, there'll be forums, discussions, and events and workshops in the future on Asian art and culture. So thank you everyone, please keep talking among each other, stay safe and take care of one another. I'll see you in other um, um, occasions. Thank you. thank you so much everyone. Thank you. Uh,